in the blockbuster 1999 movie, The Matrix. Keanu Reeves, as the character Neo, is awakened from a pod and discovers that his entire life has been lived inside of a computer simulation. Over the course of the movie, Neo and the audience discover that he is the person known in their modern legend as the One. Although computers have taken over the universe, the computer program that makes the simulated world possible requires as part of its vital program an anomaly, a glitch, if you were, a glitch that is both necessary to making the whole thing work and problematic to the machines that want to subjugate humanity. That glitch, that anomaly, is that one randomly selected person in all of humanity known as the prime program, or the one, carries within that person a special piece of the program code that gives them superhuman abilities within the matrix. These abilities give that person the power to bend the rules of the matrix simulation. It allows them to ignore physics, ignore gravity, and other laws of nature. In scripture, we also find a world that is waiting for the one. In this case, we're dealing with the real world and the spiritual world and not a fictional computer simulation. But the movies have borrowed from this scriptural tradition and have created parallels that we see both in the theater and in the stories of the Old and New Testament. We, what we find is that God, through his prophets, promised that one day he would send a Messiah, a rescuer, a redeemer, that would come to save Israel from her enemies and save the entire world from destruction, sin, and death. But as the centuries passed, Israel asked the same question characters in the Matrix movie were asking, is the story real? When will we see the one? A and whenever they met someone who impressed them, they, they might ask themselves if that person might be the one. We begin this morning with Isaiah chapter 35. As we hear God's prophet tell of the things that the Messiah would do. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will burst into bloom. <clears throat> it will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs, and the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. 
They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. It was these words. It was these words that were repeated and taught and remembered when, when people thought and dreamed about the Messiah. And so when John the Baptist sees that Jesus isn't doing all of the things that he thought Jesus would do, he begins to wonder if Jesus really is the one. And so John sends his disciples to ask Jesus that very question, are you the one? And in Matthew chapter 11, we have recorded Jesus' reply when John heard in prison what Jesus was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one? Are you the one who was to come? Or, or should we expect somebody else? And Jesus replied, go back, report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. And he said, what did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, then what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. In clothes are in king's palaces. So then, then what did you go out to see? <clears throat> a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. It was a fair question. It's always been a fair question. We have been reading the promises of God and the, the writings of the prophets for, for thousands of years. Like many of Jesus' own disciples, John the Baptist thought that the Messiah should have behaved differently. He, he, he should be doing things differently than Jesus was doing them. And Jesus' reply was to echo Isaiah and say that the eyes of the blind were being opened, the ears of the deaf were being unstopped, the lame were being healed, the mute could speak, the good news is proclaimed to the poor, and even the dead are raised. But 2,000 years later, we are still asking the same question, are we not? Was Jesus really the one? If Jesus were really the Messiah, shouldn't he have returned by now to do all the things that Isaiah and the other prophets said that the Messiah would do? It's a fair question. Because 2,000 years, let's, let's, be, let's be honest, 2,000 years is a long time. The people who had seen Jesus, even some of his disciples, were convinced that Jesus would return in their lifetimes. And then, because the Apostle John lived longer than all the other apostles, and he lived even longer, he lived really long for the time period in which he lived, they were really sure that Jesus would return before the Apostle John died. And then they were really sure that Jesus would return before the year 100. And then 
before the year 1000. And then there were some people waiting on mountaintops in the year 2000. But the calendar keeps turning. And we keep asking the same question. Is he really the one? That's exactly the question to which Jesus' brother James was responding in James, chap in James chapter 5, verse 7. He says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. As in many other things, patience is key. Students of a foreign language do not learn to speak fluently overnight, nor do students learn to play a musical instrument well after the first lesson, or even during their first year of lesson. In Star Wars, Master Yoda repeatedly admonished Luke Skywalker to have patience. It resonates with us because that's something that all of us have struggled with. All of these things that I mentioned make sense to us. They fit in the context that, that we understand. And James uses an agricultural illustration that made sense to his audience. He, he said, when we plant our gardens, when a farmer plants an entire field, we cannot harvest until the appropriate time has come. We wait. We wait for sunshine. We wait for warm nights. We wait for the rains that water the earth because, because plants have needs that must be met just as we do. Plants need time to grow and to mature. In the same way, James tells us that there will be an appropriate time. Jesus will come and that his coming is near. Rather than grumble and fight, we must be patient with one another. We must love and nurture and support one another and, and persevere through whatever this life throws at us. Rather than impatiently questioning whether Jesus is the one, we should remember the perseverance of Job and many others that we know from Scripture. People who patiently endured, people who persevered through their trials and through their lives so that we could look back on their lives and see what God accomplished through them. As we wait for the return of the one, let us be patient in our waiting, patient with one another in our struggling, and remember the examples of Scripture of those who struggled like us, but who endured so that God could demonstrate what could be accomplished with his help.